Welcome to Monarchist Minute. I'm Victor Smith. Tonight, we have a very special guest with us. He is a best-selling author and essentially the founding father of modern monarchism in the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the venerable, the talented, the incomparable Charles Cologne. Oh, my. That's, that's an awful lot to live up to. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, like we can't scare him away. No, I, I mean, man, that that's, boy. It's my I, Zoom uh, meeting. You're trapped in here with us. <laughs> yeah, there's no way out, but that's all right. I'll manage. I, I've been in worse straits before. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm sure worse awaits. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, coming up tonight, we will be talking about Mr. Colomb's latest book, Blessed Charles of Austria. As you know, last week we did a little bit of a brief review of Kaiser Karl's life because we recorded on the anniversary of his death. Mr. Colomb, uh, if, you, if you wouldn't mind giving us your sort of a 50,000 foot view of Blessed Karl's life and anything that you may have to share about the great Kaiser. Well, sure. Uh, it so happens that a week ago, when you were when you were doing that, I was actually in Madeira for the centennial, um, and it was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life, frankly, um, to finally get there and venerate the uh, shrine myself. Um, but in a nutshell, the uh, there are three interesting things about Kaiser Karl to break or to take away. One is that despite his short reign, he had such a huge impact, really, uh, on the world, and more and more as time has gone on. Uh, as the world sees things, he was a complete failure. He came to the throne with two objects, one, ending the war, and two, federalizing his country. And... Uh, establishing it on a, on a firmer foundation. Uh, neither of these succeeded. Uh, in fact, it's uh, fair to say they both failed miserably. Uh, and this was because he had very little in the way of resources to do anything with. And both his allies and his enemies opposed him. Um, the allies were interested in peace when they were losing and uh, the central powers were winning. And the Germans were only interested in peace when the Allies were winning. Uh, neither side was interested in peace when they were winning. And they, they were also short-sighted. It's, it's really quite amazing. You see, of all the major leaders in World War I, he was the only one who'd actually fought on the front line. He'd uh, demonstrated his personal courage time and time again on the Galician front, in the Italian front, Transylvanian front. Uh, he was a soldier's soldier. But on top of it, he was very much a ruler of the old school. And he felt that his, uh, his rule was a vocation from God, not unlike his marriage. And that he was married to his people, in a, in a sense, the way he was married to his wife. Uh, and like that, like with her, he had to be willing to sacrifice himself if necessary. And that, I think, goes to the heart of why he's popular um, outside his former realms, especially in the United States. They've just opened the 19th shrine in his honor in the United States, um, in Covington, Kentucky, of all places. Uh, the gateway to... It's the gateway to Cincinnati for those who are, you know, Ohio fans. But, uh, no, he, um, he epitomized a sort of sacrificial leadership that we in the modern world, and in the United States in particular, are completely unfamiliar with. I mean, we, we all know about leaders who don't mind having us die for them, but who'd be willing to die for us. That's kind of alien to our experience. Uh, in addition to that, however, he was also a great example in private life. 
was a, uh, a very devoted husband. He was a uh, devoted and effective father. And he was, and this is particularly important today, I think, he was a loyal son to both his parents who didn't really care for one another. And so he's a great patron for the products of broken or difficult homes. Uh, and what's particularly interesting about that is not just that he stayed on good terms with both his parents who didn't really care for one another after a while, but he got the best out of both of them. He got his father's charm and humor and easy manner without the promiscuity. The, the father died of syphilis, sad to say. And from his mother, he got the really deep, deep piety without any of the dourness. And that, I think, is a good example for people of difficult or broken homes today. Inevitably, there's some sort of issue between the parents with the parents, but you've got to A, love them to the degree that you can, and B, uh, get the best out of them, whatever that might have been. Um, that having been said, that, that ability to deal with difficult parents, he carried on because one of the great uh, questions historians have always asked about him is that his uh, great uncle, Emperor Franz Joseph, and his uncle, uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, whose death caused the first war, they had a lot of personal and political differences. Um, Franz Ferdinand wanted to federalize the empire. Franz Joseph had gone through hoops to get it to where it was and didn't want to fiddle anymore. Uh, Franz Joseph was quite happy with the alliance with Germany. Again, having gotten there through all sorts of unpleasantries in the 19th century, Franz Ferdinand wanted to uh, not necessarily break the alliance, but diversify allies. Uh, these differences uh, were big. And of course, the, the matter of his marriage caused a personal rift between himself and his, and his, uh, his uncle, Franz Joseph. So along comes Carl, and he gets on very well with both of them. On the one hand, he admired his great uncle. He understood what he had gone through and why he held the views he held. But he agreed with his, with his uncle, Franz Ferdinand. And more than that, and this is something, by the way, that only really came to me while I was doing the research on the book, and that is the huge influence Franz Ferdinand had on Carl. And it was very big. He was a sort of surrogate father to him, really. His guide in political affairs, and also to some degree in religious affairs. People don't realize what a devout man Franz Ferdinand was. He was very much devoted to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, when he uh, died, he was making the eight um, weekends, uh, the eight uh, Sundays, Sundays of the Sacred, Sacred Heart. Sorry, the, my mind is going. It's a little late here in Austria. The uh, seven Fridays dedicated to the Sacred Heart. The first, uh, first Fridays. Fridays? Yeah. First Fridays. He was making the devotion when he was uh, when he was killed, wearing a medal of the Sacred Heart. Uh, and the other thing too is that his marriage and family life were also a big example to Carl, and that people don't realize. Uh, but Franz Ferdinand and his Sophie were the only real example of a very happy married household that Carl could see. Yeah, and he spent as much time with them as he could for that very reason. Uh, he was very, very fortunate, Carl was, in his choice of a wife, uh, the Empress Zita, who was a Bourbon princess uh, of French, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese blood, she and herself summed up all the legitimist movements of Western Europe because uh, not only was her father the deposed Duke of Parma, but she was very close to her uh, cousins with the Carlos heirs in Spain. Her father was very close to the last direct descendant of uh, the French Bourbon, the Count of Chambord, so much so that... Uh, the Count of Chambord gave him the Chateau of Chambord. And uh, he married the daughter of Don Miguel, 
uh, that was Zita's mother, uh, the Portuguese conservative who fought the Miguelist War. So these two people, between them, Carl and Zita, epitomized legitimist European monarchy, East and West. Uh, you had everything in there but a Romanoff and a Stuart. <laughs> so uh, you put it all together, and between them, they epitomized everything that the world we've inherited is not. And I'll just conclude my narration by saying that given that he's the blessed and she's the servant of God, the likelihood is that they're both in heaven. And so when we look at their story, and we think it's a failure, we think it's a tragedy. Actually, it's not, not for them. The real tragedy is for us and our immediate ancestors who have suffered through the results of their defeat. You mentioned the you mentioned the Stuarts, so you are the one that oh. broke open Charles York's Jacobitism. <laughs> I'm sorry, say again, please. Oh, uh, you broke open Charles York's Jacobitism, Mr. Uh, uh, oh well, as one we of all... the one of the running themes of the show is that at some point my Jacobitism will come out in one way or another, and uh, for 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 the first time, it wasn't me. <laughs> Well, I feel good about that and, and my choices. Uh, <laughs> no, well, I'm a jack about myself, so don't feel alone or, or frightened. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, next week we will be discussing the Battle of Colota. So there you go. <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny thing about that. Um, on my father's side, my dad was French-Canadian, which almost always means dollops of Scots, Indian, and Irish blood and does mm -hmm. in our case. Well... Our Scots ancestor uh, was a fellow called Lachlan McKinnon, who came to Canada in 1772 from uh, the island of Egg, E-I-G-G, -G, just south of Skye. The thing is that we had known that his two brothers had died at Culloden, but we were always under the misapprehension that he had been too young to go himself. Not so. Just in the past couple of years, I found his obituary in 1837 in the Montreal Gazelle. He died at the age of 110 and was a Culloden himself. He survived? He survived. Wow. And wow. It, it's an interesting thing. It made a big difference to me. I mean, it's one thing to know you had uh, multiple great uncles who died at Culloden. It's another to know that you descend directly from a survivor. Wow. Wow. And that may, may kind of an impression on me. You know, the funny thing is that Bonnie Prince Charlie and Kaiser Carl had several things in common. Not, I'm sorry to say, how they handled defeat. <laughs> Their Kaiser Carl really comes out on top. Yeah, but, I suppose that's why Cole is a blessed and on his way to St. Hart and the Bonnie Prince isn't. <laughs> well, it's a, why, we, why we have to pray for the repose of his soul, you bet. Yes. <laughs> but uh, what they had in common was a weird kind of intuition. They frequently knew a lot better what needed to be done than the older and wiser who frequently overruled them. Uh with you see this with uh, Kaiser Karl over and over again in his various political and military uh, initiatives. With Bonnie Prince Charlie, you see it in particular in two areas. One, the Battle of Preston Pans, mm -hmm. uh, which everyone said, "Well, you know, we, we better you know disperse or something because the uh, there's just too many of them." And he he surveyed the territory, he saw there was this big marsh, and he saw sheep grazing. He said, you know what? There are sheep in there. That means there are shepherds. There'll be a shepherd who knows the way through the marsh. Find him for me, and we'll have him guide us through the marsh and attack the enemy before they wake up. And that's exactly what they did. So they defeated an army two times their number. Uh, <clears throat> but, was, oh, hmm? sorry. but the downside was that Darby in uh, January or February, I guess, of 1746, they'd gotten all the way down to the Midlands of England. England had not risen as they'd hoped it would. 
Uh, but the prince was sure that if they just kept going quickly, first Oxford and then London, they'd win. Well, they'd, uh, the, uh, they'd captured a double agent who, uh, <laughs> they captured a double agent who um, um, told them that there was an army in the neighborhood. There wasn't. Uh, and they, they overruled him, his lieutenants. And they said, we'll go back to Scotland and regroup. Well, that was a recipe for disaster. Truth of the matter is, not only was the prince right, how we don't know, the elector of Hanover was packing to leave. And the day after they left for Scotland, a messenger came from Wales saying Sir Watkin Williams win was getting was ready to raise the countryside. So there you go. Yeah, that's <laughs> that was very, very good. I wish we could bottle that audio up and save it for next week. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, you can. It's recorded. Do what you like with it. It's all yours. Yes. Uh, the, the, the wonders of intellectual property right laws where uh, I get to do whatever <laughs> because I have done that. Uh, though, unfortunately, this isn't the time where I rave at copyright laws. But anyways. Anyway, so next on the docket for today is the... Uh, a continuing legacy of people in the Supreme Court, the Senate confirmed by a, four, a 53 to 47 vote, Miss Katanji Brown Jackson. She is the third, I believe, third black person on the court, the first black woman on the court. By the way, the first black person on the court is Baltimore native Fergus Marshall, I'll have you know. Um, but well, firstly, uh, hold on, hold on. We don't know that she's a woman. <laughs> well, really? We don't she know she's a woman. That is true. We, can't we don't know them, that so she's a woman. We can't really woman. decide if she is one. Exactly. If she can't define it, she can't say she is one. That's yeah. a fair point. <laughs> well, she doesn't know she's a woman or not. She might, <laughs> who knows? She might be a man. She might be a, a, a fan. She might be. She might be a writing. She she might be an attack helicopter. <laughs> she could be a cactus. Uh, <laughs> she could be a, a cocktail coaster. You don't know. She doesn't know. We don't know. I don't know. And <laughs> yeah, we can cast our votes to see what uh, see what is uh, my vote. Cactus, probably. It, it could be. Oh. But in the immortal words of Pope Francis, who are we to judge? Yeah, <laughs> and I, I think trying to assign uh, personhood or beinghood to her future uh, honor is, uh, or it's, or theirs, or ours, or whatever it is. Um, I think it's wrong. I think we're trying to impose our views on a non-specific, uh, <laughs> semi-possible being of uh, uh, non-specific uh, uh, identity. Well, in, in, in all fairness, you know, it's not like the Supreme Court uh, has, has uh, ever not assumed things and has just decided that they know what reality is. And I, I mean, well, maybe yeah, now that she's on the Supreme Court, she can define what a woman is because they have that power to just define reality now. That's true. The Supreme Court's very much like the Spacing Guild in Dune, uh, able to change reality with their minds. I... I um... I've often thought that we went to a lot of waste in the forever war because really all, uh, all president Bush jr. Had to do was have the Supreme court throw an injunction at Osama bin Laden. That yeah. would have been it. Yeah. It would have been it. Uh, I mean, why should we send armies overseas when we have the Supreme court that can just change things? Well, that's assuming Osama bin Laden recognizes the authority of this grand Supreme Court. He will have to. I mean, he makes reality. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are you talking about, Victor? Yeah. It, 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 it's Osama doesn't have a choice. Yeah, I'm kind of scared just talking about him right now because <laughs> they have nothing, you know. I mean, uh, but but I suppose if I were going to hypothesize as to why they did just send in the Supreme Court. It, it may be because Lockheed Martin uh, wouldn't have made uh, the money, which the which the federal government, uh, which Congress has the right to increase 
uh, can, to have changed the reality of the currency supply. So, so, so there you go. The Supreme Court isn't all powerful. Speaking no. of Keith Martin, real quick, how much longer are we still waiting for that F thirty five? Obviously, some people lack faith. Uh, I would just, I would just say this about that, and and I'll, I'll tell you, gentlemen, I'm going to take advantage of my extreme age to show you how your uh, your rulership has um, progressed in the time that I've been alive. Way, way back in 1972, when I was 12 years old, they brought in Roe v. Wade. Now, you've got to understand that in those days, the vast majority of people thought that abortion was murder. And when you saw abortionists on TV and television programs and all that, they were routinely portrayed as slimy, scummy, disgusting people, almost like judges. Well, uh, they brought in abortion. And I said to my father, I said, that's a terrible thing. The only people that could do that would have to be evil. And my father said, yep. I said, but it seems to me that it, it feels as though we're ruled by evil men. And my father replied, well, it feels that way because we are. And I said, okay, all right. So I accepted the fact that our rulership was in a very definite particular sense evil but time passed it went on to my college days and i was not too not too much older younger or whatever than you guys um and jimmy carter got very upset because the soviet union invaded afghanistan and on television he said i quote leonid lied to me and i meaning leonid brezhnev and I, uh, I didn't know whether I wanted to hug him or, or slap him. But I realized something. The leadership wasn't simply evil. They'd become insane. And by insane, I don't mean that they you know neurotic or thought they were Napoleon. When leadership go insane, the ideology in their heads is more real to them than even their own benefit, let alone their subjects. Which is why, for instance, today, our leadership would rather have women in combat than win battles. That's how leadership are insane. So, okay, evil and insane, I can live with that. But then, under Obama, and not just because of him, but it was when that realization came, I realized, yeah, they're evil and insane, but they're also stupid. And I'm not being just being insulting. By stupid, I mean ignorant and arrogant. They don't know how things work. and They don't need to know. And I bring this up as a, by way of prequel, because even more representative than Madam Justice Kavanaugh of our, our governance today is our vice president. You know, if you listen to what she says, she doesn't really say anything. But there's a particular tone and a cadence to it. And I was trying to put my finger on what it was. And then I'll, I'll this is my final word on not just on Madam Justice Kavanaugh, but on the current governance of the country. I was talking to my best friend, who's German, and I was saying, I, I, I can't quite. We are live. All right. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, I did not read the fine print, uh, I, we, we were cut off because of a time limit. So we'll let uh, other Charles uh, give his uh, triumphant uh, conclusion. Well, just to say, in the light of everything I've been, uh, been yammering about just now, um, in thinking over uh, Ms. Harris's particular manner of speech, um, a friend of mine in Germany, my best friend, uh, said to me, you don't really get it, do you? And I said, no, I don't. And this is what he said. And I think it, I think it perfectly describes her verbiage. She speaks the way stupid people think smart people sound. Right. So <clears throat> with the come here type of voice or I'm speaking. <laughs> no, it's, it was very insistent. Yeah, <laughs> it's very insistent. But what it is really, 
uh, there used to be a comedian who was long before your time, a fellow called Sid Caesar. And one of his shticks was phony French. You know, he would say, Oh, et tu connais le Well, if you didn't, if you knew French, it was drivel, it was just gibberish. But it sounded like French if you didn't know French. Well, that's how, how Miss Harris is with, with intelligent speech. If you don't know what intelligent speech sounds like, yeah. But if you do, well, then she sounds stupid. Yeah, it kind of sounds like she's talking down to children a lot of times. I think that's yeah. the best way I can describe it. Well, talk, talking to children with drivel. In other words, it's like by saying, and so children, we remember always that our socks should never be made of onions. And that <laughs> whatever we do, and this is very important, do not close all three of your eyes at once. What? Huh? <laughs> but with this it's censorious... I'm sorry? That's words to live by, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it has to be done with that censorious <laughs> school marmish tone. Yeah. You know, yeah. She, she'll teach the nation and she'll teach it garbage. <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, Mr. Colon, would you like to lead us in the prayer for the canonization of Kaiser Carl? Wow, there are several of those. Uh, let me grab one. Oddly enough, I have my handy dandy uh, Kaiser Carl prayer book right by me. Um, yes, I rather like this one. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, the redemption you won for us gives the world order and peace, which we too often refuse. Mercifully receive our work and prayer as an atonement for all injustices done against your most sacred heart and against all religious and earthly authority through rebellion and war. May our prayers and sacrifices help bring peace to the world and atone for the multiple injustices, indignities, and slander done against your servant, Carl of Austria, and bring him soon to the honor of veneration as a saint. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Mr. Cologne, for joining us. <clears throat> and if, if you would like to plug your glorious Off the Menu podcast, what do you believe you and Vincent will be talking about this week? <laughs> Well, indeed, I have no idea what we'll be talking about this week. I never do. That's one of the challenges. Um, you see, the, the thing about Off the Menu is that it's entirely, the content is entirely determined, really, by the people who send in the questions. And I don't really get to know what those are until... If you, would, if you, if you would like to do this as a tribute, because I know that Delaware was done last week, let's yes. do Maryland for State of the Week this week. Uh, but oh, that's oh. not up to him. That's not, how it's not up to me either. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I think that's uh, Mr. Franchini who, uh, who determines that. Yeah, that's, that's entirely in his ballgame. What I will tell you is that my grandmother came from the Eastern Shore uh, Dorchester County. So there. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I actually have an aunt who lives in Snow Hill, Maryland, which is also on the Eastern Shore. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Years ago, they've got a very unusual accent in that part of the world, the Chesapeake accent. Oh, um, you mean like this? I, I can't even imitate it. It's 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 not Southern. It's not English. It's both. It's neither. It's it's weird. But uh, I was in uh, in uh, Seattle, Washington, and um, I was talking to a, a fellow who was in a hardware store, and he had that accent. And I said, "Oh, you must be from Maryland." And he said, "Well, yeah, but how'd you know?" <laughs> well. <laughs> I said, my, my grandmother's an Arnold of Dorchester County. And his response was, well, then we must be cousins. My mother's a job of St. Mary's County. And I said, oh, great. So I, I didn't know what to say to him beyond that. You know, it's, it's, uh, there are certain parts of the country where if you've got any connection at all, you're related to everybody. Of course. I noticed, yeah, I noticed that Washington football team uh, blanket that you have in the background. Yes, indeed. That, <laughs> and that's not any football team. That's the Redskins. 
Yes, it is. <laughs> what you, we actually had a we actually had a lot of fun when they when they revealed the commander's name. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun at their expense. <laughs> well, you know, I am so sick and tired of Walker. <laughs> Yes. I mean, don't get me started. And, and of course, the thing uh, you must have seen two years ago during the height of the hot, hot summer of burning love, when the uh, Smithsonian Institute put out that list of, of traits of whiteness. You know, those oh. things like oh, making, that, that list. Uh -oh. making appointments on time, <laughs> you know, getting up before noon. Uh, <laughs> terrible, tra terrible traits society. that we've imposed on everyone else. Uh, the calendar. I, I never <laughs> looked at it the same. I was never so grateful. Wow. Yeah. Let's discuss the oddity of this year's calendar for a little, for just a brief moment. Um, April 16 is, as everyone knows, Holy Saturday this year. Yes. Holy Saturday also falls on the anniversary of Culloden. Yes. It gives me a, a little bit of something to think about here as we celebrate the joy of the resurrection of our Lord. And we think about all the people that were, I'm just going to come out and say, slaughtered there. It, it really puts things into perspective, I suppose, how lucky or unlucky we are to not have fought a home front war in our lifetimes. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, remember, the United States have only had two civil wars in our history. Of course, we haven't had that much of a history, but still, yes. <laughs> uh, we emerged out of the first one. And the second was the bloodiest conflict we've ever fought. Bloodier than all the others put together. Uh, and actually, if you want to, if you want to put a pin on it, the number of abortions since Roe v. Wade dwarfs the Civil War casualties on both sides, and I believe. That's true, too. And of course, as I like to point out, one of the funny things about history is that certainly since the uh, Reformation a bit before, uh, the further you go, the more degenerate we become. I mean that in a nice way, of course. Um, the more you realize that the, the sides that preceded us would have been united in their disgust. So the Guelphs and Ghibellines, you know, fought over the uh, supremacy of Pope and Emperor. But they actually had the same first principles. It was their application they had problems with. But they would have united against the Protestants. Uh Luther. Similar, so similarly to the both sides of the Irish troubles, they probably would be united today to denounce the current Irish people. <laughs> exactly. And the same way the same way Luther and Loyola would have united against the French Revolution. You know, you 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 what comes after is sometimes so much worse than any any problem you thought you had. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine either Sir Edward Carson or uh, De Valera or Michael Collins having anything but a mutual disgust for what Ireland has become. Yeah. And I, I say that as someone who loves the Emerald Isle very much. Yes. It, it, and of course... Uh, this Sunday is Easter Sunday, and of course, next Sunday, the yeah, Sunday after is Low Sunday, or Dominica in Albis in Latin. I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. <laughs> Dominica in Albis. Well, you know why it had that name? Um, I have a missile here that tells me that uh, people took off, n newly baptized, took off their white. That's exactly right. Oh. It and uh, we're and um, just gonna tell our audience on YouTube that we typically record the podcast Fridays at 8 p.m. on our Discord server. Links in the description <coughs> below, bless you. Um, links in the description below, and a link to all of our social medias are also in the description below. And I believe we can also throw in a link to the Tumblr House YouTube page. If, 
Charles, if Charles remembers. Oh, you never count on the failure of my memory. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, I suspect I'll be prompt, given that I uh, put all this together on Saturday, so hopefully my memory won't have failed me too much then. Of course, and until next time, we have to say goodbye for now. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. Here, here.